Let's pray. Father, I thank you for that song. I needed that, Lord, to know and to be reminded that it is well with my soul. And the reason it, we can say that, Lord, is because, is not because everything around us is, um, is always well, and not always because everything in us is going well. We can be well in our soul, down in the bottom of our soul, because you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever, that you are sovereign and providential and loving and merciful. You know what happened yesterday what is happening today. You know the future, but we don't. You do. And as we trust you, more than we trust our own senses, our own feelings, our own thoughts, then it can be well. Though troubled, as Paul would say, externally outside of me, troubled even within me at times, we can nevertheless say that strange thing that Christians say, it is well with me. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, I would like for you to open your Bibles to the book of Jude, and we're going to stay there for just a second. And then we're going to go to the Gospel of Romans, and I call it the Gospel of Romans for a reason. So let's go to Jude. We've been preaching through this little book, and the way you get to Jude is you go to the book of Revelation and you go left. It's the only time I'll tell you to go left, as you know. And here we are, Paul, or Jude writes, we're going to get to Paul, Jude writes in verse 3, Beloved, Although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, to appeal to you, to urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Why? Verse 4 tells us, for there are certain people that have crept in unnoticed. They have, uh, as it says there at the end, they have perverted the grace of God. They deny Jesus Christ. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Now while you're opening your Bible there to Romans 1, I want to tell you what I'm doing this morning and then we'll do it. I thought about progressing on to the next couple of verses in our series through the little book of Jude. But then the Lord, as always, had a way of speaking to me and said, Kevin, I want you to, I want you to hold right here on this contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to, to the saints. And the reason I want you to hold right there, like a helicopter hovering over a, a landing spot, is because I want you to, to remind the people of the goodness and the power and the importance of the faith. Now, we have been reminded that in Jude 3, when he says that I want you to contend for the faith, he is not necessarily first talking about your faith or my faith. There is that faith. I'm to place my faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What he's talking about there is the content of what we believe. Because there were certain people who have had crept even into the church who were corrupting the very content of what they were believing. And so Jude, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wanted to remind them that they're contending not for their faith, and again, there are other places where we're encouraged to do that. Jude wanted them to contend for the faith, the gospel, the truth 
that has come in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, dear brothers and sisters, the reason this is important is because it reminds us of what our taproot is. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. I, I've been going to church all my life since nine months before I was born. Can, can I give that testimony? Anybody in here else like me, right? And, and here's what I know about church, if we want to talk about going to church, is, is sometimes even in the best of circumstances, you can forget what you're doing and what you're about. And, it, and many times it's not over bad stuff. Yeah, there's bad stuff that happens. Errant teachers come in, moral issues you have to deal with, all those things. But a lot of times in the clutter of being a Christian, you can actually forget, now what are we doing here? And what is it we believe? And what are we trying to get to the rest of the world in evangelism? What what are we doing? One of the great things I think has happened this past year is everything has been stripped down, right? We've talked about this before, all, all the extra activities and all the extra events and all the good things that we do. And, and there are good things that we do. There are good things I hope to, for us to get back to. But, but think about it. We've been stripped down to the one thing that we ought always to do, and that is to believe, contend for, share, preach, and live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness on this? This is, this is the taproot of all the fruit. This is as deep as you can go to the faith. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. So here's what I want to do is I want to be real plain on this. And, and Isaac, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Chris, can you do something for me? Right over here on this front pew are some handouts. I was tardy today. Uh, and uh, can you hand those out? I think we have enough in here for everybody. And uh, while they're handing those out, let's read what it says. Look at Romans chapter 1. Maybe the single greatest chapter in all of Scripture, although all of Scripture is great. So here's what I want to do. Let's begin with verse 8. And what Paul is going to do is he's going to remind us of the gospel. Okay, here we go. Romans chapter 1, verse 8. Paul writes, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Look in verse 14. And I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Now here's our two verses. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Can we just footnote an amen right there? Can I get an amen? To the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile. For in it, in this gospel, the righteousness of God is manifest, unveiled, revealed from faith to faith, for it is written, and here he quotes Habakkuk 2.4, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. When I was ordained to the gospel ministry, they asked me, what is your life verse? This is it. 
Romans 1, 16 and 17. If I had to take one book out of the Bible, which I would hate, if I was on a desert island, I'd take the Bible and a couple other books. But if they would only allow me one book, I'd take the Bible. And if they'd only allow me one book out of the Bible, I'd take the book of Romans. And they only allowed me a couple of verses out of that book, I'd cut these two verses out. Now, the reason this is important is because we have to be reminded what we're doing here. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. We have also learned this past year that there are a lot of things for us to be concerned about. I hear families concerned about education, put the kids back in school. I've heard people talk about politics, and these are things for us to be concerned about. We are to pray for our leaders and and to be involved in our culture. I've heard people talk about their concern about economics. I've heard people concerned about the the freedom of speech and and things like this. And, And brothers and sisters, the gospel has many things to say about all of those things. But that's not the first priority of the gospel, any of those. The first priority of the gospel answers this question. How can a righteous, holy, sovereign, sinless God have a relationship with rebellious, sinful, selfish, narcissistic, idolatrous man? That's it. Now, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of that That's the the main question. And Paul writes to this church at Rome Rome, to tell them, basically, for 11 chapters, we're going to go to the deep end of the spiritual swimming pool and jump in. If you can read the first 11 chapters and say, man, that's so easy, you need to come see me, I need to learn from you. There's some deep theology in here, some deep truths to tell us about the the salvation that's come in the person of Jesus Christ. We got to get this straight. We got to get this straight. Now, here's why we got to get this straight. Not only is it our main focus, but it's the only way, not only can we, we be right with God, but it's the only way we can be changed personally. You see, one of the errors that Jude would talk about, if Jude were standing up here talking to us today, and he would say, now you need to contend for the faith, that was once for all delivered to the saints. And the reason why is, is because certain people have crept into the church and they are preaching heresy that denies Jesus and perverts the grace of God. And you know what he would say is one of our errors? We have turned Christianity on its head and made it more of a moral therapeutic deism, that we're psychological behaviorists. All we need to do is turn over a new leaf, turn a new page in our book. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus, I'll say this again and again and again, Jesus did not come to make good people better. He came to make dead people live. We, the reason we believe in being born again, John 3.3, 3, is not because we need to just be better by increments, We need to be changed, transformed. We need a new birth. And just like a baby didn't exist before it was conceived and then born spiritually, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2.1, until we are given new birth by the Spirit of God, by believing in the gospel of Christ through the power of the Father, to every person who believes. Can I get a witness on this? Am I tracking with anybody? So what is the gospel? What is this gospel? Now here's what's interesting. And I've thought about this. Did you know that Paul had never been to the church at Rome? All these other churches that he wrote, or most of them, he had visited. He knew these people personally. Paul did not found the church at Rome. He had never been to the church at Rome. We believe that, scholars believe, and you can read this for yourself in the Bible, you don't have to be a scholar, all of you are though, 
You remember on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit fell, Peter preached the gospel. You ever read that list of people that heard the gospel and believed? Did you know that there were people from Rome? And the thinking is that those people left the day of Pentecost, traveled all the way back to Rome, and started a church. And Paul wanted to visit it. And and here's the thing. How would you introduce yourself to people that you've never met? That's very interesting. You know what Paul could have started out with in chapter 1? He could have started out saying, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. He gets to that. I was this, I was zealous for the law. He tells his personal testimony two or three times. But right here, that's not his first foot forward. He doesn't tell them that they need to get rid of Nero. He was on the throne. Scoundrel. Blamed Christians for burning down the city. He didn't start that way. He doesn't start by saying, you know, we, we need more education. We need to educationally transform. He, he gets to that. He's one of the smartest guys you'll ever meet. You know what he starts out with? He said, to the church at Rome, I wanted to come to you, and the first thing I want to do is to establish the good news of Jesus Christ. So let's go to these two verses. You have an outline there, and I'm going to give you some more verses, okay, to write in there. You can go later. What is the gospel? So we're going to talk about gospel truth for gospel living. It includes both. Here we go. Would you please notice in verse 16, and I'm just doing a reading like you would do a reading. I call this, the gospel is about a personal conviction. Notice what he says. He goes, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, I I cannot tell you how important this is. Paul can't speak for Peter. The Apostle Peter can't speak for Paul. I can't speak for you. You can't speak for me. I can't even speak for my wife or my children. You see, the gospel, whatever it is, every person must make a commitment. You cannot believe for someone else. You must believe yourself. And what the gospel requires of every person is that they hear the good news, and we're going to talk about the guts of that, but they hear the good news, and along with Paul, they say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed. I I own it. I own it. One of the things I think we're discovering about the church in America, listen very carefully, is that we have a lot of people whose names are on the rolls of churches, but their name has not been written in the book of life. They are church members by rote. They are church members because that's what you do. They are church members because their mama, their daddy, their grandparents, that's what they were. Let me be clear. I'm a Christian first. I don't apologize for being a Baptist. I'm a Biblicist. But I wasn't saved by my parents. I wasn't saved because of a building. I wasn't saved because uh, I had a great Sunday school teacher. I wasn't saved because I'm a preacher's kid. I wasn't saved because I went to seminary. I'm not saved because of any of that. The only way I'm saved is the same way you're saved, and that is you hear the gospel, and I, Kevin Shrum, at the young age at Trenton Baptist Church, received Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Let me ask you a question. Are you a Christian? I, no, I, I, hold it, Pastor. You, are you trying to make me feel guilty? No. But I will remind you that twice in the New Testament... 1 Corinthians 11, at least is one of those times, it says, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Why have you believed? Or do you believe? Or, or do you have information about Jesus 
I get this all the way. I, I, I believe that Jesus existed. I've had people tell me, I believe he did the miracles. <clears throat> Do you believe, though? That we were talking before we came down here praying in our prayer room. We were talking about who knew who Jesus was first. You know, God love you, ladies. The women caught on to who Jesus was before the thick-headed men did. Can I get a witness on ladies? Can you give yourself an amen there? They pondered these things in their heart. They kind of knew. Even, you know, the men were kind of, duh, who is he? Who are you, Jesus? And guess who else knew who he was? The demons. Early on, Jesus showed up. There was a demon. Whoa, son of man, what do we got to do with you? We didn't bargain for this. In other words, I guess what I'm saying to you, if you believe all the facts about Jesus, but don't have faith in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you, all you've done is affirm what every demon in hell believes. They believe all the good doctrine, but they don't know the Lord. The gospel is a personal conviction. And without apology, without apology, I'm calling you, if you don't, if there's a doubt, if you don't know, repent, turn from your sin, and turn to the Savior. It's, it's not complicated, it's not rocket science. Turn from your sin and turn to the Savior today. If you hear His voice, the Scripture says, do not harden your hearts like they did in the desert. The gospel is a personal conviction. The gospel, look at what it says, the gospel is also about power. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. Now, some people could say that this is an overstatement. An overstatement. Why? Why do we need the power of God? Power of God. The reason we need the power of God is because of what needs to happen in us. It, is, it takes the power of God. The gospel is about the dunamis, the dynamite power of the gospel, of God. You see... I can't change myself. I can't change you. But God can. God can because He has the power to. And it's the power that He alone has. And I want you to hang this thought on your mind. I, Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.18. He said, now the preaching of the cross... This preaching of the cross, of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, to those who are perishing, it is foolishness. So when you tell your friends about Jesus, when you tell your friends about the cross, when you tell your friends about an empty tomb, and if they look at you like you're a fool, you just join the rest of us. But Paul goes on to say in verse 18, he says, but to those of us who who are being saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God unto salvation. You see, it's not just something I must believe. It is the power of God that I experience. Do you know that power? It's real power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit to give new birth. I love the story of Nicodemus. You remember Nicodemus? Comes to Jesus at night, maybe embarrassed to be seen by him in the dark, in the, in the light. Comes at night and says, Jesus, you've got me scratching my head. Nobody can do and say the things that you do and say lest he be from God. And Jesus doesn't entertain his theological question, what he did, what he said. He goes, Nicodemus, you got to be born again. He says, hold it, 
Jesus, can, can I enter into my mother's womb a second time? I, how can this happen? And then Jesus says this. Nicodemus, it's not under your control, but it's under the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit blows where it wills. And you don't know where it's coming or where it's going, but you can see what it's done. So must every man and woman be born again by the Spirit of God. And isn't that what happened to you? It's what happened to me. I was thinking about this this morning. You've heard a little bit of my testimony. It's not much. It's not complicated. I hadn't murdered anybody. I hadn't robbed a bank. You know, that's what we have to do in order to be... No. My position before God outside of Christ is had I died before Christ, I would have gone to hell. Our sin is not just what we do. It's our posture and position before God. And I had heard the gospel more than any of y'all. I lived in the house of a preacher. Sunday school teachers, vacation Bible school teachers had preached to me the gospel, and I never got it. I was lost. But on that day, when I heard the gospel, when I heard the gospel, the power of God transformed me by the Spirit of God and gave, pulled out that old heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh, beating with the presence of the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And I was changed, and I've never gotten over it. Have you gotten over yours? Don't ever forget that you were dead and he made you alive. You were under the condemnation of sin and he made you a son and daughter of the most high God. He put in you internal, eternal life by his power and the only power that can do that is the power of God. And Paul tells these Romans, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's something that I put my arms around. In fact, I love what he says in Philippians 3. He says, listen, I don't say that I've reached it yet, but one thing I do, I love this, one thing I do I am trying to get a hold of what has gotten a hold of me. Paul, if you want to describe all of Paul's life, on the road to Damascus, God got a hold of him through Jesus Christ. And the rest of his life was Paul trying to get a hold of what had gotten a hold of him. That's the power of God. Notice what he says also. Look in verse 16. He says... I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Salvation. That is life to save us, to redeem us. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says we've been saved through the gospel. In Titus 3, 5, it says in his good time he saved us it is salvation salvation the word here means life it means to be forgiven it means to be set right it means to have your sins cast as far away as the east is from the west we are saved by the power of god by the gospel of which we are not ashamed Look at verse 17 again, 16 and 17. What is the gospel? It's the power of God unto salvation, and it's indiscriminate. You say, where'd you get that word? That's not in there. Notice what it says. I'm not ashamed of the power of God unto salvation, of the gospel, of the power of God unto salvation, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and then the Greek or the Gentile. Here's the kicker now. We preach to all people. Now I know what you're saying. And I'm going to reel you in here and hook and put you up on a stake, okay? Just like I have been. You know what we really do? You know what we really do with the gospel? We really don't believe it's indiscriminate. We don't believe it's for everybody. We don't. You know what we'll do? <clears throat> I do this. I'm going to confess. We, 
I don't know that I get up every, intentionally do this, but maybe it's because of the people that I hang around. Maybe it's because of my certain preferences, you know, philosophy-wise or religious-wise or whatever. I only end up sharing the gospel with people who are like me. And what we do is we make a list of people who potentially, I, I could see that guy coming to Christ. This past week has been a busy week, and when that happens, I need to go someplace uninterrupted to, to get this done, okay? These don't pop out of the sky. So I took the word and whatever, and I went to this coffee shop, and I was going over this part of the text, and I looked up, and I looked, it, it was a pretty nice day, and there were all kinds of people sitting outside drinking coffee. I was sitting next to these two or three girls talking about their boyfriends, and, and this guy over here was talking about some business deal, and this girl over here had purple hair and green and something or other, and all these people, and, and, and I put my head up, and, and God said to me, Kevin, do you love these people? You love these people. Well, yeah, Lord, I, if, I, if you gave me, boy, if you opened the door, I'd just, no, 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 Kevin, quit lying to me. Do you really love these people? These people that you may disagree with, they don't look at life the way you do, their lifestyles are not biblical. Do you love these people? Wow, I was crushed. I was crushed. Brothers and sisters, you love the Democrats or the Republicans in your neighborhood? Do you love those people who have an alternative lifestyle? The reason we don't see people coming to faith in Christ is because we're preaching to ourselves. We're in a silo, in our own little bubble. Not Paul. This little taproot right here about what the gospel is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God under the saving, the forgiving, the changing of all people who will believe. The Jew and the Greek. So much so that in Acts 17, you know what Paul does? Paul goes up on the Areopagus in Mars Hill to people who are not like him, and he preaches the gospel. It's like Philip, that early deacon of the early church. Deacon, you want to be a deacon? Win souls! And went to every village preaching the gospel. Preacher, you want to be a preacher? Lovingly, winsomely, consistently preach the gospel to every soul. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are all precious in his sight. Now, I don't want you to think for a minute that we're universalists. Some churches and some denominations have said, well, hey, if we're preaching to everybody, then everybody's going to get in. Right? Everybody's going to heaven. In fact, do you know the new errant doctrine that's come into the church sometimes is the doctrine of justification by death. You know what that doctrine teaches? That all you have to do to go to heaven is die. You don't have to believe anything. You just have to die. I hear it all the time when I do funerals. Oh, brother, Uncle Bobby Joe was a, he was a good guy. Can you say something good about him? I say, well, did he have a church home? Did he know the Lord? No, he, he didn't. He was spiritual. Brothers and sisters, notice what the text says. We preach to all people so that some might believe. 
They have to believe. You know the three responses you could possibly get are the same responses that Paul got on Acts 17 on Mars Hill. He preached, and here was their response. He preached the gospel, and here was their response. First group, what is this babbler saying? You know what the Greek word there for babbler is in Acts 17? It's this. What is this? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a nonsense word. What nonsense is this dude preaching about a man getting up from the grave? And if we believe him, he'll save us. Second response. Many believed. Many believed. They heard the gospel. The spirit pressed it into their soul. Born again. Church right there. And then there's a third category. You have friends like this. They said, Paul, we'll hear you again. You know, sometimes when you share the gospel, it doesn't happen overnight. How many of you in this room have been witnessing to a friend or a relative or a neighbor or somebody for years and years and years and years and you think they're never going to come to Christ, they're never going to come to Christ, and all of a sudden God opens their heart and they're saved. Those are the three responses. Kevin, you're a fool. Kevin, I believe. Kevin, hear me, tell me more. The gospel is something to not be ashamed of. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who would believe. Believe. We'll start with the Jews and we'll go to the Gentiles. Well, what's in this gospel? Here's the big thing. For in it, look in verse 16. For in it, there is a righteousness from God that's given to us from faith to faith. Don't don't let that confuse you. In faith, by faith. So so here's the deal. Oh, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Am I tracking? Good grief. Okay. I was going to do some other stuff, but we'll stop right after this. 2 Corinthians 5. And let's look at verse 16. The righteousness of God. Here it is. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Paul writes, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. In verse 16, that's another way of Paul giving his testimony. He said, there was a time when I looked at Jesus just as he's just a fleshly guy. He's just a man. But I don't do that anymore. Look at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And all the people said, amen, there it is. The old has passed away, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that Christ, that in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself. Here it is, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And here's here's the great exchange that I want to explain. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You realize what was happening on the cross, this righteousness? Theologians, historians call it an alien righteousness. It's alien outside of us. We don't have it within ourselves. So here's what happened on the cross and through the resurrection. What was Jesus doing? I have to, I, I have to explain this all the time, and I love doing this. We are sinners. Sin is serious. Not just what I do but I'm dead to God, spiritually dead in my trespasses and sins. God is totally other, holy, righteous. The Bible says he can't even look on sin. Can't even tolerate it. In Romans 3, the question is asked, if God is righteous, 
and he can't tolerate sin, and I am unrighteous and sinful, how do we get these two things together? Now, here's what some have suggested. Well, what God does is, in order to save us is He looks away from your sin. He's so loving, He looks away from your sin, and He just, he just says, it's, it's just not there anymore. That's not what Scripture describes. You see, dear friends, God doesn't forgive us because He just loves us. He does. That's, the way, that's not the way God loves us. That's the, that's the motive of His salvation. Here's what has to happen. God cannot compromise His character. He's not going to do it. He won't compromise who He is for you or me. So the question is, how can He keep His righteousness, His holiness intact, and still yet forgive sinners who have stiff-harmed Him and are in rebellion against Him and are dead in their sins? So you know what he did? He, in the fullness of time, God, this holy God, sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law that crushed us. Anybody in here kept all the Ten Commandments? No takers? The law crushes us. The law is good, but it crushes us. He was born under the law so that he might redeem those of us who are under the law. So on the cross, the perfect, spotless, sinless Son of God, upon him, God the Father poured out his judgment on sin so that I could receive, when I repent and turn from my sins, I could receive a righteousness that is not my own. That as I trust what happened on the cross and through the empty tomb, I receive what I don't possess on my own. That is the righteousness of God. And not only does He give me new birth, he gives me a righteous standing before the Father so that when the Father, who otherwise would be displeased with me, sees me, He just sees me wrapped in the righteous robes of Jesus Christ. May His name be praised. The gospel, brothers and sisters, it is the righteousness of God given to poor, lowly, but repentant Believing sinners. Now Paul says, "Whoo, I'm getting I'm, I'm beginning to become a Pentecostal here. A bunch of dead white people. Say hallelujah. Do something, man. You were on your way to hell. He got you up this morning. He sent somebody into your life to preach the gospel, and you got saved. This is gospel truth. This is the taproot. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's mine. Why? Because it's the power of God unto my saving, my forgiving, my new life, my eternal life. I believed it. I was a part of the whosoever. Somebody came and preached it to me. My mom, my dad, my grandparents, my Sunday school teacher, preacher, somebody preached it to me. And I believed. And in it, God has given me something that I didn't have. I am now righteous before Him. That's the gospel. Through His death and resurrection, that's the gospel. One more verse. Look at verse 17. Romans 1.17. says the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Uh-oh. 
this is an amazing thing, and I, I just close with this thought. The gospel is not just for your saving. It's for your living. In other words, we are to spend the rest of our days taking gospel truths. We haven't done this very well in church. And I'm not talking about just, I'm talking about in general. We just think the gospel is kind of over here. It gives us out of hell. It gives us our salvation. It gives us eternal life. But we don't, we don't, we have a hard time. How does the gospel affect how I'm married? How I raise my kids? How does, how does that work? How does that work? Because you see, there are, there are gospel implications for all kinds of... Let me just give you one example. You want to deal with your kids? You want to raise your kids? Start out with the posture, as the gospel says, that you desperately love your kids, but your kids are sinful. They're sinners. Just start right there. No, no, you... Travis, you don't know my little Johnny. No, your little Johnny, I've seen him back here in the hallway. He's demon-possessed. <laughs> See, the gospel tells me that I'm not only a sinner, but, but my kid's a sinner, for example. So the, that, that, that posture is how I approach him. Yes, I want to have discipline and love and, and all those things, but, but I, I want to see my kid have his heart changed. Right? That just helps me with my parenting. It's helps me with my parenting. Hey, you want to be married? You know how, you, how the gospel implicates you in your marriage? What did Jesus do? And isn't it interesting? What did Jesus do to save us? What did the gospel say? He laid down his life. Well, isn't it interesting in Ephesians chapter 5, where it's talking about in the... Ephesians 5.21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Well, how do we submit to one another? Well, a woman submits to the leadership of her husband. And the man submits to the leadership of Christ and to the love of his life by laying down his life for his spouse. None of this, I'm the he-man and I'm going to Put my thumb on my woman. I hope she takes a skeleton to you in the middle of the night. No, did you get, did you get to how the gospel works? The gospel tells me, Kevin, you got to lay down your life for your wife. And when I don't do that, I need to be convicted of it because I need to preach the gospel to myself all over again, frequently. So let me close with this. You say, well, give me a picture of this. As a businessman, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a, whatever I do, what does the gospel look like? Well, look at Romans chapter 12. Don't close your Bible, and we'll close with this. As all the child care people downstairs have to preach the gospel to themselves after cussing me for going long, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Here we go, Romans chapter 12. And these are all over the New Testament. And I'm just going to read to you this little section on what a Christian looks like. Okay, you got that? That's what we're reading. Romans 1 through 11 is the gospel. Romans 12 through 16, what does that look like? It's really two parts of the book of Romans. So um, let's look at verse 9. Here we go. Romans 12, 9. Hope you're sitting down. This is what the gospel looks like. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. And bless and do not curse them. Wow. Can I read that again? Bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be hearty or full of pride, but associate with the lowly. 
Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If it's possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Convicted? Gospel truth for gospel living. Let's stand. Would you bow your heads? Could I ask you that question once again? Are you a Christian? Do you personally know the Lord? Have you received Christ as He as Lord and Savior? And if you have, rejoice. Go back to that moment, or maybe it was a season. And thank the Lord. Don't, don't forget. Don't forget. Don't ever forget how the Lord saved you. Because it'll help you, it, it'll help you in the present to remember the past. Remember that? In a church service, in your home, driving down the road maybe at a camp, maybe at VBS, maybe all by yourself at your home. Now, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, would today you turn from your sins and receive Christ? Just say, Lord, I, I, I'm not going to make up a prayer for you, just, but tell him, just, Lord, I'm a sinner. I, I'm, I'm lost. I'm lost. Whatever that preacher was talking about, giving me what I don't have and trusting Christ, I, I do that right now. I do that right now. I do that right now. Maybe you have trusted Christ. And one of the gospel things is I, I need to follow the Lord in baptism. This afternoon, our... Our encounter church, the Hispanic church, they're going to be baptizing a lady. And I was talking to the pastor just a few minutes ago, and he said this lady, cancer's come upon her, and her house was full of idols, full of literally physical idols. And he said over several months, our church loved her, preached the gospel to her. She recently received Christ as her Savior. She took every idol out of her house and burned it. And this afternoon at 2 o'clock, she's going to be baptized. Not to be saved, but to make a profession before her friends and her church family that she now stands with Christ. Have you followed the Lord in baptism? Or maybe you don't have a church home. You know the Lord, trusted Him, you followed Him in baptism, you're just kind of wondering. You need a church home. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for you. And here's what I want us to do. I know these are kind of different times with uh, COVID and so on. But especially today, in just a few minutes, we're going to dismiss our service. And if you'd, if you'd like to talk to somebody about receiving Christ, or if you'd like to say, Pastor, I need to follow the Lord in baptism, or Pastor, I need a church home, and I'd like to talk to you about that. Don't leave here today without making those decisions. Now, before I pray, I look across this, I look across this room, people I love, and I see people who have a few scars in this life, some troubles, challenges you face at work, in your family. And even more than me seeing him, I know the Lord does. Now I'm going to ask you to cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. That's what the word of God says. So let's, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, there may be one.
that's here this morning or one watching who does not know Christ, does not know you, Lord. And maybe for the first time they have heard the gospel and explained that it's the power of God. They might be wondering, how can I change? I keep trying to change and I can't change. You might be wondering where they stand in relation to you, but they have now access to the righteousness of God, forgiveness, eternal life by the Spirit of God. Lord, there may be somebody here that needs to follow the Lord in baptism, making that final step and that profession of their faith. Lord, there might be somebody here that needs a church home. Lord, I know there are people here who are brokenhearted. And the gospel preach, preaches to them that if Christ can overcome the grave, there is power to deal with anything that may come their way. Would you remind them of that great truth today? And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Before I let you go, again, I really mean that. If you need to talk about the Lord, if you need to baptism, say, I'd like to be a part of this fellowship. Don't, don't just be an attender. Just come with the rest of us and put your stakes down. And You say, well, Pastor, I, I'm, I'm flawed. Can't she join the rest of us flawed folks here? Or she or she, whoever it is. Now, before I pray, we're going to pray one more time. It's very specific. We need to pray for our dear brother, George Russell. George uh, is not having a good day. I got off the phone with Vicki just a little while ago, and it's, he, he still is very serious. And, um, and I, uh, I even made him a video today. I sent it to his daughter, just, hey, we're praying for you. Um, and hopefully he'll see that maybe you've already done something like that. But let's pray specifically for our brother, okay? Can we do that? Let's bow our heads. Father, we lift up George to you today and Vicki, and we know that it's um, a very serious time, and um, I pray that um, you will bring him through this, brother, bring healing to his body. We ask this by faith. And would you bring healing to his spirit? I know he's discouraged. Would you bring comfort to Vicki and the family, Lord? Thank you for being a God who answers prayer and who has the power to do these things. Ultimately, Father, we want your will. And we pray what you told us to pray in that great prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We love you, Lord, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you part company, I failed to remind all of you that we're collecting coats. If you have a winter coat that you don't need anymore, if you have no